Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Welcome all, fellows, friends and guests. This is a joint meeting held by the Society of Antiquaries in Scotland, of which I'm president at present, uh, David Caldwell, and with the National Museums of Scotland. And uh, we're delighted to have uh, two speakers tonight uh, to, to speak to us, and uh, particularly pleased that this event is being sponsored uh, by uh, James Ritchie Clockmakers, um, a, a very notable uh, Edinburgh uh, uh, business which commenced in 1809 um, and developed as a leading clock and watchmakers in Edinburgh, famously pioneering electrical horology and collaborating with astron astronom astronomer royal Charles uh, um, Piazzi Smith in creating the mechanisms for the one o'clock gun and time ball on Carlton Hill. Today they are specialists in the restoration, conservation and repair of antique clocks and we're very pleased indeed to have the support and you're all welcome to stay for the drinks reception uh, after this meeting which will be an opportunity to engage with the speakers with uh, um, and other specialists and experts that are here. And uh, should there be any of you who are not already fellows of the society and are interested in uh, joining, uh, either I or uh, Simon Gilmer will be very pleased to speak to you about uh, what the society does and opportunities for joining. But as is our custom, we're going to start the, the meeting uh, by inviting uh, Simon Gilmer, our director, to read the minutes of our most recent meeting. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and those of you who aren't fellows, don't worry, this doesn't take very long at all. Minutes of the meeting of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, held at 6pm in the auditorium NMS on Monday 9th December 2019, David Caldwell, President of the Society, in the chair. The minutes of the last meeting were read and approved. The following communication was read. Here, here is Ain Cool of Tilly Lum, excavations at Whitefriars, Perth, 2014 to 2018, by Derek Hall. The same communication was read at 7.30pm on the following evening in the Marston Building Lecture Theatre, Aberdeen University. Jeff Oliver in the chair. May I cite that as a correct uh, record of the meeting? I think that's a yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, is there any other uh, business or no? Right. Well, I'm delighted to move on to the, the, the main business uh, of this evening. Um, uh, talk by uh, Dr. Tacey Philipson and Dr. John Taylor, OBE. Um, John um, is, a, is a, an inventor, a horologist, a collector and expert of early British clocks. He has a very impressive CV in business in uh, assembling one of the world's largest early British clock collections and as a very considerable scholar and uh, researcher. Indeed, some of his items are currently on display in the Luxury of Time exhibition showing here in the museum until late January. And I'd urge you to go and have a look at the, the said exhibition. Dr. Tacey Philipson is the Senior Curator of Science at the, the National Museums here uh, and Lead Curator for the Enquire Gallery. She previously curated exhibitions on topics uh, from prosthetic limbs to Napier's rods and the Higgs blossom. So without further ado, I'm going to invite uh, Tacey to start off. If anyone wants me to, please just wave and I will move to the um, podium microphone. The theme of this evening is David Ramsey and his watchers. So in the first part of this talk, I am going to give an overview of what clocks and watchers and timekeepers in around this period were looking at some particular 
examples in the collection of National Museum Scotland. This is our David Ramsey item, which came to us, well, as the, society, as, as the Museum of Antiquaries initially. And what is really unusual and special about it is we know for whom it was made. Because just heading off the um, screen at the top left, you can see the arms of Robert Carr, Earl of Somerset. He got those arms in 1613, and he was arrested for murder in 1615. So we're fairly sure when this dates to. And inside the back cover is a double portrait of King James VI and I and Queen Anne. So we're very inclined to think that this watch was a present from King James to his then favorite, Robert Carr. Dr. Taylor will tell you a lot more about what this watch could do. It could do amazing things. What it didn't do all that well was keep time. <laughs> Maybe a quarter of an hour a day probably needed the attention of the clockmaker quite regularly. Every, um, we know Samuel Pepys took his watch back to the clockmaker sort of two months after it was last serviced. Another treasure in the collection is by Bartholomew Newsom. This is possibly, well, is one of the contenders for the first British-born clockmaker where both his name and his work survive. And there are three clocks surviving by Bartholomew Newsom, of which this is one. He was clockmaker to Queen Elizabeth, and again, fantastically, we know for whom this clock was made. It's got two coats of arms repeated round the body of the clock, and um, those two different people shared a granddaughter. So it's very likely that this clock was made for um, Margaret Stanley, Countess of Derby, who was a cousin of Queen Elizabeth and a potential heir to Queen Elizabeth. I really, as a museum curator, really approve of this habit of putting your coats of arms on things. <laughs> really useful. The, this clock has clearly had a bit of an interesting life, and it didn't originally look like it does now on the left. It would originally have looked like this other Bartholomew Newsom clock in the Met Museum, rather smaller, much smaller dial on top. Some dastardly Victorian took the dome, took the bell of this clock, moved them to the underside, added satyrs, the bit of a support from a chalice or something, some seahorses even, i um, very grateful to a colleague, Godfrey Evans, who looked at this with me and thinks these are old pieces, but high quality individual pieces assembled. The assembly is not up to anything. Uh, so one of the morals of this story is never buy a clock from a Victorian dealer. This is another very interesting and tantalizing early watch in our collections, um, which first appears in the records actually in a talk of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland um, by Sir John Findlay in about 1920. It is a very nice and early watch in the German style. And somebody has very helpfully signed it. Jerome Hamilton Scotus fake it in 1595. Unfortunately, we don't believe this. <laughs> there was, sorry, a Hieronymus, which is the Latin for Jerome, Hamilton, a goldsmith in the Edinburgh Canongate, 
who died in 1589. But the style of the inscription, the wording, this cries out to me that somebody was trying to gain the cachet of David Ramsey, who signed his watches, David Ramsey Scotus Fake It, and having another one, an unknown maker, but just not quite good enough. However, this is still a nice early watch, regilded, possibly not by the Victorians, possibly this was the Edwardians, for sale to a not quite knowledgeable enough collector. But the really exciting part comes for me when you look closely at the engraving. This is Germanic in style. One of the very characteristic things are all those twos that look like Zs. Another interesting point is each of the hour marks has a raised dot. So you could tell the time by feel if it was dark or if your eyesight was failing. I've um, looked up what um, cataract operations at this period were like. They had them, and I would strongly advise you not to look up what they involved. But you'll see above the 12, that is a Scottish lion there, a bona fide Scottish crest. Down at the very bottom, beneath the six, is a crowned fleur-de-lis. This was a watch with Scottish design, even before that spurious inscription went on it. And I've blown up, possibly too large, the engraving in the center of the watch, which was said to be Edinburgh Castle. We've been looking at it. We think it's more likely Stirling Castle. But it's a really important and fascinating Scottish watch, which unfortunately somebody tried to make it even more important and uh, failed. <coughs> this German watch, on the other hand, the society was given, when was it, in 1782, which preserved it from the ravages of Victorian dealers. And it again is dated much more plausibly to the end of the 18th century. It was one of the very early items collected and preserved by this society. So just a quick digression. We're so used to nowadays to the term pocket watch. These were not pocket watches. This is Lord Darnley as a stylish 17-year-old showing off how they were worn, round the neck, so you could see them. If you had one of these hugely important and expensive pieces of kit, you weren't going to hide it away in the pocket, now were you? You were going to show it off. And so many portraits of this era, you will see both men and women wearing something large as a pendant, whether it's a watch, whether it's a jewel. This, we're fairly sure, is a watch, because you can see it's got the watch key tied to it. Um, so not, not a pocket watch. Those were very much clocks and watches for the top ranks of society. From the early 17th century, a very characteristic British clock was developed, which was the lantern clock. This made timekeeping, mechanical timekeeping, a realistic potential for the merely prosperous, the prosperous farmer, the merchant, rather than the top ranks of society only. The brass was a more expensive material than iron to work with, but it was actually much faster and easier to work with and refine castings. And Humphrey Mills and his 
nephew Richard Mills were two of the early makers in Scotland of these types of clocks. If you may, you may have noticed, you may not have, every clock, every watch I showed you so far only had an hour hand and not a minute hand. And we can actually see that this Richard Mills clock has no business having that minute hand. If you look closely at the divisions between each hour, they're divided into quarter hours for this um, reading with only an hour hand, not into five for reading of minutes. So this minute hand is a later addition from somebody upgrading a clock and wishing, wishing to keep it going, keep it working as a working clock rather than a relic of its history. All these clocks, however, were, by modern standards, relatively poor timekeepers and would have needed to be checked quite regularly, probably daily, against a sundial or maybe against the church clock, which itself would have been checked from the sundial. And you've probably noticed churchyards very often have a sundial in them or on the side of the church. That was to keep the church clock in time. But this sundial, which was made in and for Aberdeen, has another feature that is very revealing of time at its period in, um, in the early 18th century. And that is that it shows the time not only in Aberdeen, but in Rome, in Constantinople, and in Jerusalem on um, the inner rings a completely and utterly useless piece of functionality. They hadn't invented the telephone yet. They hadn't invented the telegraph. If you wanted to send a message to Rome, you gave it to a man on a horse and then a boat. The time difference had no practical purpose, much like many functionality on electric gadgets I've met recently. But what it would have done is shown off sort of the owner's astronomical knowledge and interest about how the Earth moved and time changed around the Earth. But the other thing that's really revealing is in the modern world, if you have clocks that show the time in Tokyo, New York, London, they're all out by an exact number of hours. And this isn't. It's out by five minutes here, an hour and 15 minutes in the other direction. This is natural time, where noon is when the sun is in the south. And time is four and a half minutes different in Glasgow from Edinburgh. Because again, that's all you need when it takes you so long to travel. But also, this is the time difference that is needed to work out your longitude, how far east and west you are. And if you can work out and keep <coughs> your time, keep a watch, keeping good time as you travel, you could then compare it with time on a sundial, local time, and work out how east or west, how much east or west you had traveled. And this was known by all navigators. It was just the clocks weren't good enough. A quarter of an hour a day is too, too much. And John Harrison famously associated with successful timepieces. But this timepiece recently acquired by National Museum Scotland, was the very first attempt to determine longitude by means of a pendulum clock on a ship at sea. It was only six years after the pendulum clock had been invented, which revolutionized timekeeping. This was the first clock that would be accurate to better than a minute a day. It was fabulous. If only it would work on a ship, 
so many wrecks could be prevented. And Alexander Bruce of Kincardine was the man who financed this, <coughs> paid for it, so he gets the credit. He also put in quite a bit of the intellectual ideas. And um, as you can see, he was a cavalier. He was a royalist in this painting. But he had been a member of the court in exile in The Hague. So he turned, in part, to Severin Oosterwijk, a Dutch clockmaker, to make clocks with his refinements, his design. The early Royal Society were involved. They were so proud of this that they put a picture of the clock only a couple of years later into the frontispiece of their very first history. It's that triangular thing hanging to the left of both the images. Needless to say, those of you who know anything about pendulum clocks and how they like to be kept still and vertical, this was not a success. But this was one of the beginnings where it was realized how hard the longitude problem was. So it's hugely important for science. The clocks fell off. They got damaged. You can see a potential repair there. And eventually, the idea was abandoned. Not before the sea captain, they had asked whether he'd please test these clocks. He, of course, said, yes, they were brilliant, because that was the answer they wanted. So, of course, he told them it was. But he so over-egged the answer that they were suspicious and realized that, no, this hasn't worked. This was abandoned. And the clock mechanism, useless on board ship in this hanging case that was supposed to keep it steady while the ship swayed, it was put into an ordinary domestic clock case, another of these alterations. But it's thanks to that alteration that it survived. This was not the only mechanism from that experiment. There were two of them used at any one time. This was one of Bruce's bright ideas, is if you have one of the clock where the pendulum is swinging across the ship, and you have another clock where the pendulum is swinging back and forth along the ship, well, of course, one of them will be upset in a storm, and the other one will be happy, and you'll, one of them will keep going, won't it? That didn't work either. But it does mean that there was more than one mechanism made. And the other mechanism was acquired a few years back by the um, Maritime Museum, Royal Museum of Greenwich. Um, again, it had been altered, in this one, into a domestic long case clock. But they remain, for me, a really exciting relic of the endeavors of clockmakers to push the mechanisms during the 17th century. They were pushing at the boundaries of what was possible and trying things. And it's not until you've tried things that you know whether the answer is, is yes or no. So thank you very much. Oh, it's worked. Good. So it was a good start, isn't it? Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Tra Tacey has told us a nice history, and I'm going to try and concentrate on to uh, David Ramsey himself. So he was born in uh, 
1590 or 1580 or thereabouts. Nobody's found his uh, birth certificate. We know very, very little about him. He's just like Shakespeare. Um, we know Shakespeare through his works rather than from his history, and David Ramsey is in the same capacity. Uh, I'm not a, um, an academic, and so that I've used information from these um, uh, clever people. I graduated in natural sciences from Corpus Christi in June uh, 1959, and I tried to do a PhD in geology in Antarctica, but the government cut my funding even before I started. Um, so that was the end of my academic career. And I've done no personal research, but rely on the work of these others. I'm also dyslexic, and I had to grow up finding ways around my problem, and that made me notice things um, beyond the written word. So this is where uh, David was born here. This farm just south of St. Andrews. Uh, bring it a bit closer. Courtesy of Google Maps, isn't it wonderful? <laughs> and David was apprenticed on the 24th of May, 1594. That is a date we've got because it's in the uh, annals of the uh, armourers. And he was uh, uh, um, apprenticed to um, Henry Smith, who shortly afterwards became appointed the royal armourer uh, by King James the uh, Sixth, and creating a sword or a defensive breastplate or um, a barrel of a, of a pistol, this required better steel than ever used by a cooper to go on a barrel or a horseshoe uh, by a blacksmith. And so David's training was not only in blacksmithing and making uh, the armour, but also right back to collecting the ore, buying pure ore to get an even greater um, purity of the iron to withstand the sword thrust or the pistol expanding with the gunpowder inside. And this required a lot of uh, finding, travelling and getting the, the best materials and the processing and the quality control. And King James himself, who had this armour, uh, he loved the theatre of dressing up. And here he is in a, a contemporary print. And he never actually wore armour at all to have a fight. He never led his troops into battle. And there's his sword. Um, and this is a sword in Windsor Castle. Um, one of King James's swords, and you see the basket is the same, and it's covered in gold damasking, which is performed by scoring the surface of the iron and then rolling the gold so that it fills into the cracks. And as you really press it, even the steel itself crozes round the round the gold, and it all uh, locks together. So you have to have very pure gold and very high quality steel, so it will work. And even the Prince of Wales got in on the act. Um, here he is, dressed up in armour. And what young people don't enjoy dressing up? And what could be better than dressing up in a suit of armour? It certainly beat, uh, beats uh, Star Wars, isn't it? So over to David Ramsey. Um, he's really known as a watchmaker, but he did also make a few clocks, or should I say he signed a few clocks, and he signed a few watches. Um, and this is an interesting clock. Um, uh, Tacey showed some uh, clocks which had been altered. Um, this one shows the, um, the time at the top. The bell is inside here, and round on the four sides, are uh, the four evangelists. And so Matthew, this is a painting obviously, um, has the uh, angel to guide him. And you can see the angel engraved here. And Matthew hard at it. Mark 
had a winged lion. And here's the lion inspiring um, Mark. Luke was inspired by an ox writing the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles. I, leaning over his shoulder, checking how his spellings are going on. <laughs> and he's not quite so prominent in the picture. He's looking in the other direction here. And of course, the last one was John. And he was inspired by an eagle. What this cloud beast is, I'm not quite sure, but he seems to be looking at that rather than the eagle. <laughs> And here's the eagle. And so it's very ecclesiastic in its um, four sides. But the interesting thing is what is engraved on the bottom. And you've got this lovely scene um, of, it's interpreted as, here's the Pope with his nose on the grindstone, cranked by the two Protestant clergy with the um, cardinal with his regalia in the background and the uh, three Catholic priests um, worried about it and then you've got King James and his two sons but what I wonder is Who's this? He's got a bigger hat than anybody else, and his face is bigger, and even more so, who's this? He's right in the center of the group, and he's even got a crown, and his face and crown is bigger than the king's. So who on earth can that be? And nobody seems to know. So answers on the postcard, please. <laughs> I told you I'm dyslexic and um, I see words as pictures and pictures as objects. Um, so when I see a crown like this, I see it in three dimensions. And it didn't look right to me because this is the crown of Scotland and it's the oldest surviving British crown. And yet look at the, the top. And look at the top of this one, it's completely different. Look at the, as against those, completely different. This has got the cross in the front center and the fleur-de-lis in between the supports. The Scottish crown has got the fleur-de-lis on the center on the four supports and the, crown, and the cross in, in between. Um, it isn't that crown, is it? But if you take the English crown, he's wearing this um, English crown. That made me think, well, what, what else have we seen which has got crowns in it today? Do you remember this picture? And this crown? It's much more like the English crown than the Scottish crown, isn't it? And you remember this one? So again, it's much more like the English crown than the Scottish crown because of the, the position of these crosses, the position of the fleur-de-lis and the shape of the top. So, it fascinated me as to who these um, extra people were in very prominent positions and he's got this crown and the only thing I can think of and this was given to me um, by the researcher in Newcastle um, that it's Frederick uh, V, the Elector of Par uh, Palatine on the Rhine in the Holy Roman Empire and he was negotiating with King James uh, to marry his daughter because it was part of the Protestant alliance. Um, that's a possibility, but 
who this one is, I have absolutely no idea and nobody else seems to. It's lots of things are suppressed and a few years later um, a, a print like this was in London when uh, Charles was trying to marry off um, his daughter to, uh, to Spain and uh, he suppressed it um, because it was anti-Catholic and he was trying to get uh, some peace with Spain regardless. Um, so it survived surprisingly hidden away underneath the, the bottom of the clock. And the top of the clock, um, the dial, you see it's lost its, its hand. And so you can't actually tell the time with it. You wouldn't even know it was really a clock without a, a hand to show what it was meant to do. And it's, it's a beautiful dial, um, but it loses its purpose. And I can never understand why museums um, know something is missing and won't put something back on with a little note saying this is a replacement. Um, it's, it's very difficult for somebody who's uh, not actually in the know to come to look at this and think, well, that's a bloody funny clock. So he, Richard, sorry, uh, David Ramsey <coughs> made these wonderful watches and this is one in the Victorian Albert. And look at the engraving in the centre here and all, all these beautiful engravings all the way around. And the whole, the whole thing is so tiny that the, the centre there is about 18 millimetres in diameter. And you've got a church, um, trees, fence, bushes. Um, it, it's just amazing, the, the detail and who had the sight to do such a thing by candlelight without spectacles. Um, it's probably done by children. So to King James's watch um, and his complications so that the inside you, the top of the watch you've got um, his royal coat of arms and his motto, Blessed are the peacemakers. And in the bottom of the watch, you've got this uh, portrait of him himself. And you've also got a spelling mistake. You can see that's the, looks like the print that this was taken from, doesn't it? This is the King James astronomical watch made by David Ramsey in about 1618. That's some 15 years after James came down to London to be crowned King of England after the death of Queen Elizabeth. It represents the absolute pinnacle of watchmaking with a level of craftsmanship and engineering 400 years ago that you would struggle to reproduce even today. The watch is a multi-featured device that does so much more than just tell the time. Opening the watch to show the dial, we've got the time, the day of the week, the month, the zodiac, the date, the moon's age, the moon's phase, and the planetary hour. Now, it's a bit difficult to take these all in, but if we speed up time 3,600 times, so one second becomes one hour, it's much easier to see how all the different dials are read and work in relation to one another. The watch has an hour hand, but does not have a minute hand. To tell the time, we look at the position of the steel hour hand pointer on the silver chapter ring. The distance it has moved between the two numerals enables you to estimate the time in minutes after the past hour. And this estimation is also helped by the red half hour markers marked with small red flowers. Can you tell the time now? Yes, it's half past five.
On the nine side of the dial is the day of the week aperture. The detailed engraving is incredible on a disc, measuring only 19 millimeters in diameter. Imagine the craftsman making this by candlelight without magnifying spectacles. Every day of the week is represented by its ruling planet and the associated god. Sunday, we have Apollo with his golden laurel reef and bow and arrow. Monday, the moon, Luna, with her crescent moon headpieces and her bow and arrow. Tuesday is Mars with his sword and shield. Wednesday, Mercury wearing his winged hat, carrying his herald staff for the two entwined snakes. Thursday, we have Jupiter, the king of the gods with his golden crown, lightning bolts and trident. Friday is Venus, the goddess of love, carrying a small child. Whereas Saturday, Kronos has his scythe and is carrying a dead child. Each hour of the day is also assigned a ruling planet by astrologers. Knowing the planetary hour would inform the viewer, or his fortune teller, when making important decisions. For example, Venus might indicate an hour for love, Mars with dealing with paperwork, and Jupiter for good luck and good company. The planet hour disc is geared directly to the hour hand. On the three side of the watch, we have the lunar date and the moon phase apertures. On the average, it circles between a new and full moon in 29 and a half days. Here, it's only engraved for 29 days. The moon phase disc has 59 teeth, which are all filed by hand. See some smaller than the average. Here's a full lunar cycle, speeding from new waxing to full and waning back to new again. At the top of the watch is the date, the month and the zodiac dial. The silver outer dial is engraved for 31 days. The date is read using the small blue steel fleur-de-lis and the month and the zodiac are identified with the long pointer. The watch would have to be recalibrated several times over the course of the year to take into account the differences in the lengths of the months in the Gregorian calendar. Of course, when this watch was made, both England and Scotland still used the Julian calendar, where the year changed at the Feast of the Annunciation on March the 25th. All Catholic countries had adopted the Gregorian calendar. Does the gap in the months between December and January, showing the new year on the King's Watch, give a further indication it was made in a Catholic country, likely in Paris? Here you can see the 12 zodiac signs engraved on the pierced golden dial. Can you read the date now? <laughs> yes, it's the 25th of November, my birthday. The watch has a silver top and a silver bottom cover. And on the top here is a picture of the king himself, whereas on the bottom there's the royal coat of arms. And the two, the top and the bottom, are engraved with pictures from Ovid's Metamorphoses about the life and love of the gods and the interaction with nymphs and humans. 
Livre 4 on the top cover is engraved here, and on the bottom one is Livre 2. I think the interesting thing is the use of the word Livre, because of course it's French for book. And then I think this is a further indication that the whole watch and the mechanism and the engraving was performed in France. At the bottom here, there's a tiny little cherub. He's holding a scroll, which has de Heck skull. And it's short for Gerard de Heck, who was a renowned engraver who worked on the outskirts of Paris at, at uh, uh, Blois. The silver band around the side of the watch here is engraved with a floral scroll and a picture on the three side of Kronos clutching his sand glass and on the nine side a picture of St. James with his sun hat and his sword at the ready. That the watch has survived at all is remarkable, but here it is, still ticking away, displaying more functions than most so-called modern complication watches. It's difficult to remember that this watch was made some 400 years ago, when astrology was an important part of many people's lives. Alchemy was a respected research activity that continued throughout the 17th century, and Sir Isaac Newton was one such who devoted many, many hours trying to turn base metal into gold. Truly this watch, by the foremost watchmaker of his age, David Ramsey, is an item fit for a king and can still amaze and delight us some 400 years later. A few weeks ago, actually, this other watch came up for auction and it appears that the signature, just as the watch from uh, Ramsey had a spelling mistake on it, this one seems to have as well. The rock crystal case itself was a replacement, so it's no help in dating the watch. Um, but I think it's so very, very similar in its layout, the size of all the parts, etc., that they came from the same watch factory. It isn't identical, but you wouldn't expect it to be identical because they had no drawings in those days and they made the layout to fit the gears as they made them. So here's another spelling mistake in Scottus. Scott A's in here. So again, I think it was uh, not made with David Ramsey nearby to uh, keep his eye on things. So again, it points to being in both of these made in Paris. And if you look at the ornament on the, these cocks, they're virtually identical, as is this engraving all the way around the edge here. They're very, very similar, you see. And the mechanism is just as remarkable. How they made these, look at the <coughs> tiny, tiny, tiny pieces of brass which are left there. How do you drill a hole like that um, or cast it with this tiny, tiny piece? And um, how do you get a saw or a file in to create it? It just amazes me how it would be made even today. Charles took over when um, James died and he slowly fell out with um, uh, David and whereas James wanted uh, not only a clockmaker, he used David as a gentleman of the bedchamber. So he took part in the private conversations of the king and had more influence than a privy councillor 
who only talked to the king in the privy chamber, which was outside. Um, but he was getting on in age. Charles I was a young man, impetuous, and um, he started being sent away to do some of the jobs for, in a diplomatic way. He came up to Scotland um, to try and smooth over the introduction um, of the introduction of this new common prayer book. Um, and it, that didn't work either, did it? So they slowly parted and Charles then appointed Edward East as his uh, watchmaker. And then, of course, the Civil War broke out. And when the Civil War broke out, David Ramsay was owed 2,000 quid by the king. And, of course, when he was executed, he had a small chance of getting it back. And he was thrown into debt because his debtors now realised he wasn't ever going to be paid and wouldn't give him any more credit. And um, Cromwell then came up with a bright idea as he was wanting to get rid of all the royal pieces. And so he made a bargain with David that he could get out of jail and search for all the pieces that he knew that the king had had or given and sold. And then they, the troops went round and then collected these, and David got 30% of the takings, um, which paid for him to get out of jail. And of course, his workshop itself slowly ran out of work because the whole of England, and the London in particular, uh, people were sat on their hands and wouldn't buy uh, frivolous d ornaments um, which you wore to impress people in your, with your wealth. It was a rash thing to do in parliamentary times. Um, and then the death of Cromwell, his son took over and about this time David had been the master of the clockmaker's company and conspicuous by his absence. And when he was really old and a pauper, he turned up at the, um, the watchmaker's company and voted himself uh, a pension. Um, so that's how he ended his days. He died in 1659 in London as a pauper and he was about 79 years old. And in his, on his will, um, on his death, he left his wife a widow, but very little else. Thank you very much.